Okay, so great question to start off with. So I, I run a, a portfolio called the Inflation Deflation Economic Cycle Model. And the model told me to get defensive starting in January. And the reason why I got defensive in January, because I thought we would enter a period of disinflation and then deflation in the second quarter of this year. Um, but most importantly, highlighted with a period of very slow economic growth, slowing economic growth dramatically. Mm -hmm. So the latter part of that hasn't changed. But the former part, the disinflation morphing to deflation has changed. But it's not inflation that's engendered by a healthy economy. It's inflation engendered by bottlenecks and more supply chain disruptions because of the war in Ukraine. Um, so uh, the, the, the short answer here is yes, we will, are very much prepared to being defensive. My clients know this and we have the performance to prove it. Um, it's paid off for us in that we haven't lost anything close to what the Dow and the NASDAQ and the S&P are down, not anywhere near in the neighborhood of Ms. Woods and her disruptors. The only thing she's disrupting is people's retirements. <laughs> and and I, I don't mean to, I, don't, I hate to highlight that, but you have to do macro. You can't just say I'm buying some high beta stocks with, with promising earnings in the future when you enter sectors one and two of my spectrum, IDEX spectrum, which is a slowing economy and one where inflation will be eventually uh, slowing, maybe even crashing in you know, the later portions of this year. Because if it wasn't for Russia invading Ukraine, I believe oil prices would have been already way below $80 a barrel as opposed to $100 a barrel, which is keeping, you know, wheat, wheat is, a, I think Ukraine exports 25% of the world's wheat. Russia is a huge uh, exporter of energy. I think it's 12% energy. So yeah, we're having a lot of stagflationary um, conditions, but the, the, the crucial point is we are slowing rapidly <laughs> in terms of GDP and earnings, Mm -hmm. And that is not at all in the minds of what I call the deep state of Wall Street, who is like the Tom Lees of this world. It's like, hey, every day is a good, every day is a bottom, you know, and a good day to buy. Mm -hmm. You have to do macro. You have to understand the rate of change of inflation and growth and invest accordingly. Otherwise, you're going to end up like Miss Woods. And I don't want to lose half of my assets under management or half of my retirement savings personally because I don't understand the rate of change of growth and inflation. Mm -hmm. So Michael, when we think about, let's say, you know, that that crashing inflationary idea that you're you're speaking about, what could cause that? Is that the the lack of growth, the the you know, recession that is that is looming, or is it, you know, a a, a deflationary crash that would destroy a lot of credit that we could see the the fed causing by raising rates you know i could see by your i could see your all of your head because you have a little little less hair than i do and the size of your cranium tells me why you ask such great questions that's a <laughs> wonderful question well mr pento uh inflation is seven and a half percent year over year and i know that i'm aware of that i think it could go in february we have a, a, a cpi print coming up in a, in a couple of uh, days now Maybe a week or so. Uh, I think that inflation print could be 8%. So why in the world are you talking about disinflation and deflation? Are you a complete moron? No, I'm not a moron. Complete moron. Uh, I will tell you this. What causes disinflation and deflation is going to be the same thing that always causes it. It's a seizing up of the credit markets. And I see a very salient risk of a complete shutdown in the junk bond market and the commercial paper market the banking system, money market accounts, everything but the repo market, because the Fed has this stupid you know, standing repo facility. But even if they do, and they do have a standing repo facility, that doesn't ameliorate the issue of a crashing stock market, a crashing real estate market from a freeze of the credit markets. You know, what would cause a freeze in the credit markets? I know that was your next question. Well, the Federal Reserve is going to be the most, is going to be the most hawkish Federal Reserve 
on a rate of change basis in the history of the Federal Reserve. What does that mean? They're going to go from printing $120 billion towards the end of 2021, they were printing $120 billion a month, mm-hmm. to printing zero on March, I think it's March 11th, March 11th. I got the Treasury refunding data, so I know it's public information. They're going to, that's it. They're, the Fed is not going to purchase any more Treasuries or mortgage-backed securities in just a matter of about 10 days. Okay, that's a pretty big rate of change. Then they're gonna go from 0% interest rates to something close to 1% by July. That's another big, big change. Mm-hmm. But the biggest rate, biggest uh, issue is gonna, the Fed is gonna once again enter into quantitative tightening. And they have a $9 trillion balance sheet. Mm-hmm. They're gonna be selling, according to what, what I've researched, determined they will be selling about $80 billion a month or more, 80 to $100 billion a month of primarily mortgage-backed securities because they want that $2.7 trillion of MBS off of their balance sheet. They only want a balance sheet consisting of treasuries. Well, if if they're starting to dump $2.7 trillion of mortgage-backed securities, they're going to absolutely surge the cost of home ownership. Uh, Mortgages are going to go through the roof. Mm-hmm. They've already mortgage rate rates are already rising rapidly. They're going to go up much higher, and the reason why the Fed is going to have to do this is because they understand that the lower middle class and the poor amongst us Americans are heading into penury. They cannot afford their rents anymore. Owner's equivalent rent is up twenty percent year over year. In reality, that's that's probably closer to the real rate of inflation. Twenty percent. They are killing the the least vulnerable, I'm sorry, the most vulnerable amongst us, the least willing to be able to handle inflation are getting wiped out in this country. And guess who they vote for primarily? They're Democrats. And they put Biden in office. And Biden is going to try to reappoint Mr. Powell, who has, has failed completely. Completely. The man is completely feckless. And I'll tell you why I say that. If you put me in charge of this country's money supply and the purchasing power of this currency, and I destroyed it by 8% year over year, and I was still, as bad as that is, Tom, I was still printing money in March of 2022. What in the world is this man still printing money and expanding his balance sheet when you have 8% year over year inflation, which is a figure of probably reported in middle of March. That's the figure I think is going to come up. Mm-hmm. That is incompetence of a, of a massive degree. And the only reason why he's doing that is because he's afraid he might upset some of his friends in private equity. I mean, what other reason could he have? So, uh, yeah. They're going to have to address inflation. They're going to have to crush it. The only way you can crush inflation is by crushing owner's equivalent rent. And the only way you do that is by popping the massive, unprecedented bubble in the housing market, which, by the way, is at an all-time high relative to incomes. Michael, when we think about you know, the, the, the bad job that, that Powell has done, as you, as you brought up, do you think that it's more a case of how the system is set up and the incentive structure and the political appetite for doing, you know, the quote unquote right thing, taking the pain, taking the medicine to correct the imbalances in the economy rather than, you know, just taking the easy way out? Well, uh, can I ask you a question? What is the easy way out? I, I would like to ask you, what is that? I mean, what is the, is there an easy way out? Is there a, a path of innocuousness? Like, uh, if that's a word. Uh, 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 is there a path you can take that will end up being innocuous, or causing no harm at all to this country? I mean, look what the Fed has done. Because they have the arrogance and hubris to say, we have a tool. We have a tool. It's called counterfeiting money. And we can print money anytime we want to. And it masquerades as real savings and real you know, uh, productivity, real uh, Real, real wealth, and it and it fools and tricks people into believing that they have something that's maintaining its purchasing power. And every time the stock market goes down significantly, we come right in there and start printing money. And we don't even need recessions anymore, Tom. It's a, it, you know, 
Recessions are great because they purge the economy of businesses that have no, you know, model that does that they don't have a model that works. Mm -hmm. They also purge all the excesses that are in the economy, like asset bubbles. But we don't want that because we have become so arrogant, not just Americans, it's it's Europeans, it's Chinese, it's certainly the Japanese, you know, it's not just, you know, it's not just Powell. We believe that we can, you know, um, we can obliterate the functionality of markets. And by doing so, we created the most unsustainable, immense and dangerous triumvirate of asset bubbles that has ever existed. So stocks, bonds, and real estate, all in conjunction. And they have to break them. There's no way they can continue to keep them afloat. Because if they do, let's just say Powell says, oh, you know, you know, Putin's, he's uh, causing some problems. And, um, I think the stock market, you know, it's down. I think the S and P is down about nine percent this year, or something like that. Nasdaq's down 14, 15 percent this year. I don't think raising rates is a good idea, and I don't think draining the balance sheet is a good idea. Balance the sheet is a good idea. What do you think is going to happen to the long end of the bond market? It, it, it's absolutely going to start to rise intractably because you're telling people you have no credibility. No way of defending the purchasing power of the world. No way of defending our sovereign bond market. And you're going to end up having interest rates soar here in the United States. So, they, you know, you can't have a 1.7% 10-year treasury note when inflation is 8%. Unless you're going to tell me that the Federal Reserve is going to actively fight inflation. Mm -hmm. And they're and they're telling you that if that if that if what I just said is going to be assented by Mr. Powell, he's telling you we, we can't. We can't because we can't allow the stock market to ever go down. Well, the stock market is going to go down regardless because of stagflation. So you better do the right thing and at least try to protect the most vulnerable of us in society who cannot afford a home any longer. They can't afford rent. They can't really afford food any longer. And Powell pretends to care the most about these people. So it's time to, to show them you care by your actions and do your job and get the rate of inflation closer to your asinine 2% target, not close to 10%. Mm -hmm. So Michael, as you, as you bring up the Russian situation again, I, I just want to go back to that for, for a second. Considering how much the world relies on Russian commodity exports, like you said, energy and wheat, could we see the situation really develop into a watershed moment if China really starts to, to back Putin militarily and economically? Well, I, listen, I, I'm by no means a political expert. So I'll tell you what my, my visceral response to that is. So when President Biden says, you know, well, we're not going to really put boots on the ground, which, by the way, I'm not I'm not saying that's something that we should do. Mm -hmm. But when you can, when you when you convey to your enemies that you won't address it, address their incursions and annexations militarily. Well, this is what you get. So now Putin's going to annex crime. Uh, he already annexed Crimea. He's going to annex Kiev and Ukraine, then he might look to the Baltic states. And if China, throw, here's the thing, and you mentioned it, this is again showing how much smarter you are than me. If China throws their weight behind Putin, then I think Putin will be emboldened not only to take the Baltic states, but I think he will also have absolute impunity from the sanctions because they, Russia could use China as a conduit to sell all of their stuff mm -hmm. that they need to sell. Um, and then I also think that China might be emboldened by what they see Putin get, getting away with to, you know, that Taiwan, the island, okay, or China, the, the one country, one nation, two systems that they had in place was supposed to end, I think, 2037 or something, some day, I, I forget. Forgot exactly what the date is, but it's around there. They might they might just expedite that whole process and just mm -hmm. take take the PLA, People's Liberation Army, move into Taiwan, 
and say, well, you know, what, what are we going to do about it? We're going to sanction. We're going to tell China, don't, don't buy our treasuries anymore. What are, gonna, you know, what are we going to do? Ch China, don't sell us anything. We don't make anything really any. <laughs> Look at our trade deficits are, are, you know, at record proportions. What are we going to tell them? Don't, you know, we don't want to buy any of your stuff anymore. You think, <laughs> you think we have a problem? You think we have a problem now with inflation? Try doing that one. I mean, you know, I don't think Xi Jinping is unaware how powerless we really are, and the hegemony of the the hegemony of the United States has uh, attenuated greatly. And that would really serve uh, another function to kind of really decrease the appetite and the usage for the U.S. dollar as well. If China started backing Russia and let them use the yuan or the or or pay them in yuan for their their commodities too correct well right russia has already de-dollarized their uh, trade surplus mm -hmm. and they put it into gold <laughs> and I, I imagine you know the reason for that is that you know if we had our if they if, if china and russia had their trade surpluses in treasuries then the treasury could say oh you know we're not you know you can't sell these they're, you know, they're not in your possession and we don't, you, you can't trade them and you can't redeem them. Um, it's much easier to do that when your reserves are in dollars. But if mm -hmm. your reserves are in gold, what, what, you know, they're in, they're in gold and they're in Russia. So, you and know, energy. Nothing, <laughs> yeah, and, enough, and, and energy, there's nothing you can really do. The United States mm -hmm. can't, really, what are you going to say? You can't sell your energy to us? And that, I don't think the United States is going to do that. So, you know, they can, they can, they can move bullion to and from China, to and from Iran, in exchange for goods and services. It can be done. It really can be done. So it, it ameliorates our ability, you know, it attenuates our ability to hurt Russia through sanctions. And mm -hmm. I would throw China in that mix as well. So the de-dollarization of the world is in place. Now, does it, now I'm long the dollar in my portfolio. I have been <laughs> for... Um, I want to say about almost a year now. I think it was March of 21. I entered the long dollar trade. It's been a very good trade for us, by the mm -hmm. way. So I am not saying that the dollar is not going to lose its purchasing power. It has, mm -hmm. and it will continue to do, to do so. I am long the dollar vis-a-vis -vis the euro and the yen. Okay. So when you say the dollar, you have to say it's, it's a, a currency. A relative it's term, fair. right? It's mm -hmm. always relevant. Against what? The mm -hmm. dollar is going to lose its value against gold and maybe against Bitcoin and maybe against energy and maybe against, you know, you know hard assets. But against the euro, the answer is no. So I'm mm -hmm. long the dollar against the euro and it's bang. So, Michael, what economic indicators are showing us that we're a long way from the bottom of the stock market? as we keep hearing on the mainstream financial channels. <laughs> it's, been, it's so fun. I, I love, I mean, I guess if you have a, a, a an agenda that says you always have to be long, or you're trying to sell some firms, bonds or stocks, you have to be always bullish. I understand people who are independent who don't understand how to do macro. So um, I'm looking at things like the break even spread. I'm looking at LIBOR spreads. I'm looking at the 10-2 spreads. I'm looking at high yield OIS spreads. So I'm looking at the, just, I have 20 point, 20 point model. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the high frequency components that say, wait a second, this is just getting started. If you look at the, the whole predicate of the model is based on the rate of change in the G3 nations as far as fiscal and monetary policy. And, you know, we have the biggest fiscal cliff since World War II, which we're just go we just started going over it in January of 22. That's when the that's when the fiscal cliff really started. Mm -hmm. And we've just barely gotten started with the monetary cliff. On a rate of change basis, the, the biggest monetary cliff in history. Um, and it's global. It's not just the United States, it's global. So I, I mean think about well, okay, look at the stock market. Look at the valuation of the stock market at all time record high valuations, at least it was about a month ago, January 2nd. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, all time high valuations. And you look at the fiscal and monetary cliff, then you throw in the war between Russia and the uh, Ukrainians and possibly the Balkans. 
uh, malfe malfeasance in China. Um, and then you think about the base effects where we see, you know, on a rate of change basis, the largest fall in earnings that we've ever seen. I mean, earnings growth is going to go from 45% in 21 to something like, you know, maybe low single digits. You throw all that into the mix and you say, well, how the heck can we be bottoming yet? I, I mean, it, it, it's mind boggling. I mean, anything's possible, but I'll tell you the odds of that happening are low single digits. Mm -hmm. Michael, when we when we think about your your model, the way it's built, what is the broader scope of of kind of where we are and and what direction that that model points to? Do we proceed from a short deflationary time to growing inflation or stagflation, or or how does that progress to you? So um, the progression is uh, was inflation and growth to stagflation to disinflation in Q two to possibly deflation in latter portion of Q2, depending on the reaction function of the Federal Reserve. I am, I am of the belief, my, my base case scenario, is that the Federal Reserve is not only going to be raising interest rates, not by 50 basis points, by 25 point increments, mm -hmm. so you get a rate, a rate hike in March, a rate hike in May, and a rate hike in June. And there's no meeting in, in April, that's why I skipped that month. So you get 75 basis point of rate hikes. And in that March, April timeframe, the Federal Reserve announces their plan to watch paint dry. But <laughs> <laughs> otherwise known as quantitative tightening, mm -hmm. which didn't really turn out to be watching grass grow or paint dry, unlike what Yellen and the rest of the uh, money printers tried to convince us. It turned out to be absolutely devastating for the stock market and for the repo market. Um, so I, I look for the credit markets to freeze again. I look for the stock market to continue to plunge until it plunges 30% or something north of that on the headline averages. And then I look for some kind of change in the Federal Reserve and the Treasury. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe. I, I'll tell you this. My base case scenario, again, is that the Fed put is still in place, Tom, but it's much lower than any of these deep state of Wall Street charlatans will have you believe. Mm -hmm. It's not down 8% on the S&P 500. It cannot be. There's not a, I don't care what Putin does. There's not a chance because there's, by the way, there's two sides to Putin. A, yes, it will slow global growth by disrupting some, some supply chains. Mm -hmm. It also will and has and is exacerbating the inflation greatly, mm -hmm. okay? Look at soft commodities, look at energy. So the Fed just can't pick one. They, you know, they can't say, oh, the economy's slowing, so I can't, I can't do anything about this growing stagflation. They have to do something. They will continue to follow that path of tightening monetary policy until something breaks, and I think it will. That is deflationary, massively deflationary, but I would look for that um, occurrence to change my portfolio to get ready for what I see would be a um, a move by Treasury and the Fed, unholy union it is, to once again uh, launch helicopter money and send you know base, universal basic income, trillions and trillions of dollars, all of it will be printed by the Fed. So that's, that'll be back to a stagflation, which would make this period of time look like a Sunday picnic. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll hesitate, I will, I will, I will, um, say very, very quickly here, I will hasten to add that that doesn't mean it's a green light for all of the stock market. You have to be selective to know mm -hmm. what to own in stagflation. So yeah, it 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 really points towards the the dichotomy that the Fed faces if they're going to if they're going to fight inflation or if they're going to prop the stock market back up, right? And that you well you can't do Tom <laughs> That's why I point to the, little, the dichotomy, little, right? There's little dissonance there. You're, you're such a bright guy. I'm so glad I'm on the uh, show with you. Uh, there's a little dissonance there, right? A little, mm -hmm. you, know, you can't do both. What are you going to do? Are you going to defend the one percenters like me um, uh, and the people who own the four, the 60 percent of people who own stocks or the 40 percent of the people who have one thousand dollars to their name mm -hmm. and, and are renting? What, what, what are you going to do? You can't you can't do both. I mean, you could try to do both, 
by maybe going a little more slowly, but you're, but you're still, you're going from, again, you're going from ZERP and massive QE to raising rates and draining the balance sheet. That's a, that's a trenchant move that will affect and is affecting the stock market. Regardless, this is, by the way, I didn't know Russia was gonna invade Ukraine, but I could have told you that, that emerging markets were gonna get killed Mm -hmm. And they have, because in sectors one and two of my investment spectrum, the last thing you want to own is foreign markets because the dollar always strengthens when you have deflation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, you know, going going back to that, the idea of that dichotomy, and you you're saying that the the Fed put is a lot lower than most people think it is. That also, I think goes to your point that basically that that program to save things once we get down to those levels is going to have to be much bigger and not you know each dollar that they're going to print is not going to be nearly as effective as it was before right of course well yeah i mean mm -hmm. you know you have um the dollars created already have been inflationary and didn't lead to any productivity or very little productivity so you know you're just comping the dollars you printed before, so you're not going to get hardly, you know, the the the, uh, the growth that you get from each dollar is all you know, closer to zero. Mm -hmm. uh, they call it a multiplier. Exactly. The multiplier of the dollar is like a, a, a penny, you know. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I I just you know I can't I can't emphasize this enough that when the Fed starts to come to the rescue again, wherever wherever that put is. Um, think about what they have to overcome. So, and I'm writing a commentary, so I'm just going to uh, preview this by, by this interview. Mm -hmm. um, the Federal Reserve, for the first time in history, the Federal Reserve will be um, going back into a dovish stance when the interest rate is going to be close to zero. And never before has the Federal Reserve gone to a, uh, a dovish stance when or when the economy was entering into a recession, which is what we're entering into, when the Fed when the Fed funds rate was near zero, it'll also be doing that when the debt to GDP ratio, national debt to GDP ratio, is 130 percent, 30 trillion dollars over 30 trillion dollars, Tom. This is records. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, to, and to, I'll throw in that the fact that the Fed's balance sheet has gone from four and a half trillion to to nine trillion in the last two years. So. Just saying, oh, here comes the, the put has been elected. Here comes Mr. Powell. Uh, really? Is he going to cut rates? Well, he can't do that. Is he going to go back into QE? Yeah, I guess he can. Mm -hmm. But what is that? What's the signal you're giving to our foreign creditors? What's the signal you're giving to domestic buyers of bonds? You're saying, <laughs> I mean, the 10 year treasury can go from one and a half percent to 10. You know, I don't think that's good news for the stock market. I mean, you're just telling, you know, inflation expectations are going to become massively unmoored and you're going to have, you know, stagflation destroy the economy. So I just don't think it's going to be that easy. That's my, I hope I'm making my point clear. Mm -hmm. The Fed can't do what they used to do because of the nation's debt, because of the balance sheet and because they don't have wiggle room. Uh, this is also the first time in forever that the Fed will be turning dovish with inflation seven and a half percent. So it's it's so crazy to think about. You know, it, it, you got to think about these things. I do because mm -hmm. I'm not a, a you know a passively managed pigeon. I mean, I want to manage your money in the most prudent way I possible, rather than just saying, "Hey, you know, it's going to be fine." If you just look out five or ten years, these disruptive stocks are going to be all well, great. Or Tom Lee can tell you how wonderful things are going to be. Um, but I don't want to lose 50% on my portfolio like everybody else did in 2000, 2008. Uh, the Russell lost it in 2018, 30%. Um, the, the crash of 2000, when things went, everything went down 30%. So I just don't want that kind of loss because I don't think it's coming back as quickly as any people think. Mm -hmm. So, Michael, considering how your model points, has it you know, pointed to increasing your allocation to gold recently? 
It absolutely has. So I sold most of my gold, almost all of it in, I want to say August of 20. Mm-hmm. Um, I then, I then put a 5% position like a year or so after that. Uh, but now I'm at, I want to say about 15, 18. Wait, no, I want to be accurate here. So <laughs> I'm about 13 to 15% gold right mm-hmm. now, close to my max 20%. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I've increased good because real interest. So you think about what, what drives gold. Is it, it isn't Vladimir Putin directly, although he's starting to think of Russia is buying gold again. It isn't, you know, conflict in Ukraine. What drives gold is falling real interest rates. And that's, you know, nominal rates coming down and inflation staying where it is or getting worse. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what's happening. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what's happening.